Being young is meant to be a blessing, but in Kenya, it can also mean poverty, despair, and a descent into crime and violence that undermines social stability. With one of Africa's fastest growing youth populations, frustrated by corruption and official neglect, is Kenya's ticking time bomb set to explode? Youth is beauty, or so an old North African proverb goes. But can too much youth be too much of a good thing? Across my continent, the numbers of young people are increasing every year. This youth bulge, as it's called, should be a source of hope. But instead, it's causing unprecedented problems. In Kenya, which has one of the largest youth populations in the world, the main challenge is unemployment and its harmful consequences. As the country's young people struggle to find a meaningful place in society, we've discovered that widespread corruption, lack of economic opportunities, and neglect by successive governments are pushing their frustrations to boiling point. Some fear Kenya has become a ticking time bomb. My name is Soria Samura, and I have come here to see what this crisis really means for a country that has long been considered one of Africa's success stories. It is early morning in Nairobi, the capital city of Kenya. Thousands of young people make their way to work. Many thousands more, however, are simply searching for work. Roughly 70% of the country's youth of working age, almost 10 million people, are unemployed. George, who I have come to meet this morning, is one of those looking for a job. Today, he's on his way to one of the city's industrial areas in the hope of finding employment. When we arrived, there were already hundreds of people, most of them young, all waiting with the same idea. George was left to join the crowd and hoped today would be his lucky day. So, George, what are the chances that you're going to be picked today? Uh, the chances that I'm going to pick, be picked today is limited. I'm just, it's very job, slim. Uh, I'm just gambling if I can. And how long are you going to wait for? Here, you can stand here for uh, maybe half a day. Uh, because you never know the time you, you can be picked. Huh? Well, good luck. Let's keep fingers crossed. Let's see what happens today. Okay, thank you. George graduated from university in December last year with a diploma in electrical engineering, but has so far been unable to find work. It looked like his luck may have been in, however, when supervisors from the factory came out to assemble all those that were waiting. One by one, they called out for people with skills for positions that were currently available. Out of the hundreds waiting, around 10 get a job, at least for the day. This is the grim reality facing the millions of unemployed youth in Kenya. Have you ever been lucky to have been, I've been given a job? Uh, yeah, one time I worked for three months, then I stopped again. And when was the last time that you worked? Last year, November. Last November? Yeah. Have you got a family? I have two kids. And how do you look after them if you don't have work? Uh, if, I, if, I, if, I, if I'm not working here, I go out and washing for others' clothes, washing for people's clothes outside. You get money. Is it, the same, money. Is it yeah. the same for you as well? Yeah. 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 These are the real phases of Kenya's youth unemployment crisis. In a country where almost 80% of the population is under the age of 35, some have labeled it a national disaster. But of course, Kenya is a democracy, and in theory, these people have a voice. So one way things should change is through their elected representatives. Elijah Kani is the leader of a youth group in the second largest slum in Nairobi, Mathari, which has approximately half a million inhabitants. Back in March, during Kenya's general elections, he decided to run for office. We followed his campaign. The reason why I'm campaigning for MP is because my community is still the same. It has never changed since I was born. I, I see the same problems. Who is to blame? Now we want leaders, people who will deliver. And that's why I want to challenge these people, to show them that 
enough is enough. We want development. Elijah aimed to get most of his support from the youth, from people such as 23-year-old Moses. Like many in Mathari, Moses has little faith in the government's willingness or ability to change things for the poor. He says unemployment and poverty in Mathari is so bad that youth have turned to crime, often with devastating consequences. Local graveyards are filled with young people who have been killed by the police. Many of them, he tells us, simply on suspicion of committing a crime. This is my friend Edgar. We used to do a lot with him. There he is. Uh, he was shot dead by the police. He was not in a mission. He, he was found in the ghetto and the police were looking for him. Instead of arresting him, they killed him. Then there is Jimmy. Jimmy was shot near his home, near his mama's house. James was shot this uh, year as well. Yeah, he was shot. He was at his home. He was shot in, in, in his mother's home. Was it a stray bullet accident? No, no, no. The extrajudicial. See, I told you the police act brut brutal to the youth. Yeah. Here, here it is Kamau. Kamau. For Kamau, it was even worse. Because now, what happened is that they actually killed him in front of people when everybody was actually seeing it. That was only two months he, ago. Two months ago, they, they took him. So See, what they did, the they took his hand, they the shot city. his arm, they shot his left arm. He was now, he, he couldn't do anything. He was lying flat. They took him, put him in a corridor, and they shot his head. Allegations of extrajudicial killings by the Kenyan police have been widely reported since a 2009 UN mission concluded that the practice was systematic and that a culture of impunity prevails. The Kenyan government rejected the findings and those made by other human rights groups. But for the young men of Mathari, it's just another sign of official indifference. Most of these people in, in this place are very bright. Yeah. Kamau here was a very bright person. Yeah, yeah. He, he captured everything that you can tell him and he could use that in practice. But now where is he? Yeah. Six feet under. Look at Jimmy. Jimmy, don't have Jimmy, to Jimmy was a brilliant footballer. He was an excellent footballer. Now his talent is no more. There he is lying, a young man. Now, you know, the, the government doesn't help even the football clubs. The government is, we, we don't care about the government. Okay. I don't think if anybody cares about the government. Okay. The government has never been helping since I was born. I've been raised in the slum all my years, and I've never found any, anything that has come to help the, to help the slum. What, what is it that you think the government should do? What one thing, at least, you know, to help you guys turn things around. Bring us facilities. Yeah. Bring us the resources. Yeah. Bring us tools yeah. to work on. Yeah. Bring us hope. Yeah. Give us give us give us the, what give us something that we can we can believe on. Something that we can tr start start as a foundation. We we can create our own things if we only lay if we only have a foundation to start on. This is for my fallen soldiers. We miss you. Listening to these youths, you know, expressing their concerns, their worry about the, their own future, about their survival, is very, very disturbing. And in fact, what is even worse is the fact that they're so intelligent, they are crying out for support, they don't seem to have anywhere to turn to, they've lost all faith in their own government. And this, to me, seems to be painting a very bleak picture in this place. In poor areas like Mathari, people have to find their own ways to make money. Moses invited me to see how he Sorry. makes a living, cooking a drink called Changai, a cheap alcoholic Sorry. brew that is sold widely throughout the country. They are brewing the drink illicitly, so it is done in the night. <laughs> this is the cash crop of Madare. Many families rely on it to have food. Moses only takes home about a dollar or two for an evening's work. But with such scarcity of proper employment, it is these low-level black market industries that now account for four out of every five new jobs in Kenya. But while many young unemployed people in the slum areas turn to crime, others try to support each other by joining together in youth groups. Moses, who used to be heavily involved in crime himself, is the founder of one such group called Ghetto Marvelous, which has around 55 members who stage entertainment shows every weekend. Down here in Drisi is where all the negative things happen. Now we try to bring the positive things through the youths. 
That's why we came up with this group, where people will be busy creating things. It was encouraging to see the collective spirit of these young men and women, but the truth is that job prospects for most of them are very limited. Not only are many of them poorly educated, but with seven out of ten youths unemployed, proper jobs often go to those with money and influence. Corruption, as it so often does in Kenya, makes things impossible. If you want to have a job, you must bribe to have a job. So it's very difficult to get a job when you don't have money, especially you are from a poor family. Is there any one particular job that you really tried hard to get? Yeah, I went to try to be a soldier. I went for the recruitment, but I was told without a hundred thousand, there's nothing you are doing here. Uh, where we come from, uh, crime has been the main means of survival among us, the youth, because you find uh, that when life becomes tough, you have nowhere to go and seek a job. You have to turn into to crime to make the ends meet. Yeah. Do you believe that the government care about you, the youths at all? The government doesn't think about the poor. Let me tell you something. The rich people here, they rule the town. A poor family doesn't have a, a voice in the ghetto. Transparency International has placed Kenya as the fourth most corrupt country in the world. And it's a problem that affects every section of society, with law and order worst of all. Last year, to find out what young people here are up against, two of my colleagues, Anas Aremio Anas and Peter Murumi, performed two simple undercover stings. Anas never reveals his identity, so his face has been blurred. Their first part of call was a court just outside Nairobi, the sort of place where young Kenyans accused of crimes might hope to get a fair trial. Our undercover journalists had heard of a clerk known to take money for providing inside information. Inside the courthouse, they found their man. After telling him they wanted to buy a case file, he took my colleagues outside for negotiations. 5,000. OK, can I give you 3,000? 4,500. Tap, tap, tap. We went around the corner to make the payment. Chief, OK. Can I make the payment now? Can I make the payment now? Then the file, an original ruling that was supposed to be confidential, was ours. We could have used it to affect the outcome of the case. We'd also heard about a young man who had been detained by the police simply for having too many colors painted on his bus. Like many arrests here, it seemed more like an effort to extort money. To see how easy it would be for the police to drop the charge, we paid this officer and his colleagues around $50. The young man was freed. But it's not just corruption in Kenya's judiciary that's a problem. It's a norm in every level of life. Our candidate, Elijah, found this out for himself back in March. It was clear that he didn't have much money for his campaign. But like youth everywhere, Elijah held hope close to his heart. My opponents have a lot of money but they can feel my presence on the ground because I'm walking around, meeting people. When we have a rally, people will come and show up in big numbers. It's because I'm one of their own and I'm ready to challenge these people. To show them we don't have to fight for, for people who are not ready to help us. But Elijah was up against a political machine run by a wealthy opponent called Maina Wanjohi. And money, as I've seen so many times, was about to make the difference. One day during the campaign, we joined an election meeting of young men and women invited to the local town hall. We watched as they were called up by a Wanjohi campaign worker to receive just under $4 each. As one of the attendees explained, these meetings are clearly designed to buy their votes. We've disguised his identity for his own safety. It's no surprise that against this background, young Kenyans are being pushed to the margins, struggling for opportunities. But what could this mean for the country? And why is the population so young in the first place?
I went to meet Dr. Alex Easy, the executive director of the African Population and Health Research Center, to find out. It's a demographic event that is occurring. It's something that many countries went through as men at different stages in their, as they move from very high fertility, high mortality, to very low fertility, low mortality. They will create this reservoir of people that survive. Uh, generally, it can be a good thing. And what makes it a good thing is our ability to harness the economic potential of such a large proportion of young people going into the labor market. However, if the youth board is not managed effectively, this large proportion of young people can then create a potential threat to stability, to economic growth and development. For now, that threat to stability is being reflected in the crime statistics. With so many young people out of work, it's little surprise crime is on the rise. Kevin, not his real name, is also from Mathari. He is 31 years old, but has been an armed robber for over six years now and has even killed two members of his own gang. Every assignment there is requirement and if you go against our rules and policy for our security purposes, definitely we will eliminate you. And you kill them yourself? Yes, me personally. What is it that led you to turn to a life of hard crime? I turned to a hard crime so that I can finish Desta University, a degree that I started. Tuition fee, it's roughly 250,000. Where could I have found it? This pressure from my own family also. My mother want this. She want me to take care of the sibling. I am unemployed. What was the only means to provide for this big, huge family was to go to a hard crime. How many people do you know that are turned into crimes like you? Uh, crime is everywhere in, 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 for, in an informal sector. In Madara, you cannot walk from 9 p.m. To, to, to around 6 a.m. You cannot walk in Madara. So what me, I'm saying that the unemployment is very rampant, and if they have only left, the, the only vacants, job vacants, is hard crime. That's why we have flooded. In Kenya, we are flooded. And what do you think would happen if these people were to get jobs? Me, what I will say that majority of them will quit crime. It's not that I like crime. It is not something that is in the bloodstream. It is an acquired behavior. It is because of frustration of the society, frustration of the government, the frustration that we get from our parents, that we find ourselves in that, pushed in a corner. But when we are given a chance, Yet it would be unfair to say the government is doing nothing at all. Although it hasn't been able to create the huge number of jobs necessary, it has spent almost $45 million trying to help young people help themselves. The Youth Enterprise Development Fund is one of the key programs of this approach and is giving interest-free loans to youths for business startups. We joined Simon, one of the fund's district officers, as he went to monitor one of its recipients. The fund can only be accessed by groups of nine or more people. So far in his district, Simon told us that they had made loans to 130 groups. This urban farm now employs 15 of the original group members. Why don't we see many more of these groups in this place where you have you know, thousands of unemployed youths. I would say to some extent uh, there has been kind of ignorance in the perception with the youth that uh, the, anything that comes from the government, it is very hard to, to get. But then they have not taken that initiative to try. So basically what you're telling me is that if these youths come together as a group, it will be easy for them to access these funds. It's actually the easiest way. Speaking to the group, however, they had a slightly different view on the conditions attached to the funds. So they say you must be in a group of which most of the youths here don't think it's okay if we come together. Secondly, we have to go to the area chief, which is a bit tricky also because most of the youths here, you know, they involve themselves in crimes, so they won't access the, youth, the chief's office. Thirdly, you have to have a bank account which is running of which it's also a bit difficult if you're not financially stable, like our group. Most of the youth, they are not, okay, they, they lack education. So we need civic education from the government to come in. It was very encouraging to see how this group had managed to benefit from the fund. And it showed that with the right implementation, these policies could work. 
The reality, however, is that the vast majority of youths in this country are not accessing the fund or are simply unaware that it even exists. Is this their lack of ambition or government indifference? Rafael Obonio is from Nairobi and is an advisor to the United Nations on Youth Affairs. He believes successive Kenyan governments have failed the youth. During uh, campaigns, you see a lot of politicians come out to say, uh, we want votes uh, uh, from young people, we value young people, we are going to take uh, into consideration their concerns, we're going to deal with youth unemployment. But once they get into power, nothing happens. In fact, I think government and politicians are actually antagonizing young people more. They are marginalizing them further. They are actually pushing them to positions, situations of desperation more and more. Raphael also works with the Youth Congress an independent youth empowerment organization. They have organized a community dialogue circle, a gathering of youths from around the city to discuss the issue of youth unemployment and invited us to chair the discussion. Many of those present have college and university education. I see no future for Kenyans with the same, same kind of governance still in power. Unless the system changes. And how is it going to, you know the question is here is, goes into two. Is the system going to change through war? Or are they going to just use their brains and feel like we should take these things to the rightful people who deserve this? Here in Kenya, yeah. it's, cor it's corrupted. And it's like if your person is not known in the, in the big, system. big places or big in jobs, or ni you can never get a job. Even if you, are, you, have, you have that merit, even if you are qualified, I mean, you are nobody in the society. You know, listening to you guys, you can tell that uh, there's deep, deep frustration going on in this place. How worried are you about the future of this place if employment is not addressed soon? If the employment issue is not addressed on time, we are going to have a kind of a bigger population that is not going, even the government is not going to raise it or to take care of it. And this population is going to increase in the crime. We have seen things like civil war. Idleness is going to result to civil wars in the country because we are scrambling for the same asset and uh, on the resources. We don't, like, we don't have the resources. What are you going to do? We'll have to fight. Is Kenya really staggering blindly towards more civil unrest? These youths seem to think so. Their words were particularly frightening for me. It was these same conditions that led to a youth revolt in my own country, Sierra Leone, which ended in a devastating and horrific civil war. Clearly, Kenya is not at that stage. But it is not new to civil disturbance either. The recent terror attack at Westgate Shopping Mall in Nairobi was not the work of Kenyan youth, but just six years ago, after an election that was widely condemned as fraudulent, youths across the country exploded in a fury of violence that tore across tribal lines, killing almost 1,300 people and forcing over a million to flee their homes. The question today is, can the situation in Kenya change? For Elijah, despite a positive campaign, the money ranged against him was too great. He lost the election. They bribe people. For me, that's a bribe. When you call people for a meeting and then after the meeting you give them money, that's a bribe. That's how the system will, will be. So nothing will change. All we need to do now is stop complaining and work towards uh, our solutions. Nothing will change. Kenya has been a beacon of hope for many of us in Africa. But I worry for the future of this country. There are too many African states that have failed because they neglected their youth. It's such a waste. The question for me and for many of the young people here in Kenya is, Will the elders and the government find the answers to their problems, or will the youth have to find it for themselves? During our time in Kenya, we tried throughout to get an interview with either the president or a government minister, but no one was willing to speak to us. The youth in this country are crying out for change, but their pleas appear to be falling on deaf ears. Despite their numbers, those we have spoken to are angry, disenchanted, and feel neglected by their own government.